Should you or shouldn't you use graduated filters for landscape and travel photography? It's a question that gets asked a lot and we'll take a look today to see if we can come up with an answer or not. When I first started out on my photographic journey, there wasn't a lot of companies who offered truly neutral density graduated filters. Lee filters, for example, dominated the market from the point of view of being truly neutral. And you also had high-tech filters, at the bottom ends, there was coking, which were known for adding a colour cast on your images. But since the explosion of landscape photography through the mediums of Instagram and of course here on YouTube, things have changed. There's a whole plethora of companies out there wanting to market and sell you graduated filters to help you get it right in camera. We're not here to discuss each of those companies and their merits. There's a far too many. We're here to discuss if you should or shouldn't use graduated filters in your landscape and travel photography. For photographers, it's a phrase that gets banded around a lot. I want to get it right in camera. My raw file has to evoke exactly what I saw in front of me at the time. It's got to be perfect with the minimum amount of post-production required. Now granted, Graduated filters do allow you to get your exposure right in camera, but if you choose the wrong strength of filter, then trying to fix it in post-production is a pain. You can see, and I do see a lot of people, both professionals and amateurs, using graduated filters, and their positioning of them really is something to be desired. If you're going to use a graduated filter, make sure that you cannot tell a filter's been used. If you want more information on how to choose the correct neutral density graduated filter, then I have a video which I'll link to up there, which I did a few years ago now, and it will show you exactly how you choose the right strength of neutral density graduated filter. The video demonstrates three different ways in which you can choose your ND grads, from basically using just live view to matrix metering to spot metering, for those of you that are a bit more advanced. and. As I said, I'll link to it up there. Hopefully you will have seen the information come up. Now talking about using the right graduated filter, if you've metered correctly and you've got the right grad in place, the amount of time you spent in front of the computer is less. But on the other hand, you do get a lot more control over the final exposure with two different exposures that you can blend together. If you are going to blend, then you're going to have to learn a range of techniques in order to successfully blend exposures together. A couple of years ago, I produced a tutorial where I explained several techniques for blending exposures together. So again, I'll link to it up there and have a look at that. With a graduated filter or digital blending, you are going to come up against some hurdles such as trees or an uneven horizon. Either they've been darkened down by the grad or in the case of trees, you're trying to remove ghosting creating by taking two shots moments apart with the wind just blowing those tree branches and leaves around. Now, I'm not saying that either one is better than the other because that's going to cause endless debate, but there are many people who believe strongly in either digital blending or those who prefer graduated filters. In the end, well, who was right? For the real deal, neutral density graduated filters, you are going to find them expensive. But that expense ensures that you've got filters that are truly neutral and they have no color cost. But wait, there's still the cost of the holder plus the various filters to contend with. So what do I mean by that? Well, there's soft, hard, medium, and very hard graduated filters. And normally most brands have five different strengths within those. So multiply that five by four, and then the costs start mounting up. Now, did I mention there's also reverse graduated filters? So you better start saving up for the full set and hope that Santa Claus or Rich Spouse can help you get that full set. And let's not forget, apart from the cost of filters, that they can scratch and break as well. And I remember one cold morning, I had a resin filter shatter like glass. By taking two different exposures though, or taking two different exposures, it costs you nothing. So you've got that to think about. So instead of having to spend all that money on grads, you could just take two exposures. If you take the weight of grads as well, that's going to add on. And so for somebody like me, 
who does fly a lot, I've always got to think about the weight limits with airlines. If you start adding up, for example, just hard grads and soft grads, a full set of those, that's still probably at least 500 grams or more. Which doesn't sound a lot, but when you're going airline weight limits, then it is a lot. So think about that. Now, by this point, you might be thinking, I'm thoroughly against graduated filters. Honestly, folks, I'm not, okay? They are extremely useful, and if, like me, you do a lot of time-lapse photography, then you'll find just how useful they can be. Now, certainly when it comes to those holy grail day-to-night sequences, then they can really help you control those final exposures in camera. The change of light during those sequences can be very, very dramatic, and having a grad in place will really help and I've done over a thousand easily over a thousand time-lapse sequences and I can honestly tell you from my experience in real-world experience how useful they can be they are at times a real lifesaver now you might be asking can you do an exposure blended time-lapse sequence yes you can it's absolutely possible I've done it however you've got to be extremely focused when you're doing it and you are essentially doing two time-lapse sequences in one camera so it's you know pay your money and kind of take your choice but what's the problem with doing for example an exposure blended time-lapse sequence well as i said you're having to do two time-lapse sequences at once in camera which sounds impossible but it is impossible and then You've then having to deal with, for example, the intervals. Why does the interval make a difference? Because in time-lapse photography, if your interval is too long between exposures, then the, then the time-lapse can look quite choppy. So bear that in mind as well before you think, oh, I'm just gonna do an exposure blended time-lapse. There's pluses and minuses. So yes, you get more control, but it can be very, very difficult at the end of the day, I promise you. If you have a very broad dynamic range in your scene, then you're going to have to add on a number of different graduated filters. By doing this, you introduce the probability of having a very dark looking edge to your sky and also an unevenness if you misalign those graduated filters. Aside from this, the more filters that you add onto the front of your camera, and then the more you're likely to have some softness in your images. It's not really what you want. But Going back to exposure blending, for example, you avoid this because of the control that you get by taking various exposures. Yes, it then means your processing skills are going to have to be top notch, but then which is the lesser of two evils? You decide. How about the weather and graduated filters? Well, if it's raining, then you're going to have a tough time keeping those grads free from streaks as you're forever wiping off the water. It's easier keeping the lens dry and clean. I've been there many times and it's frustrating when both the grad and the cloth you're wiping with start becoming waterlogged. You start getting smears across the filter and it's basically just game over. Of course, you can put a lens hood on if you're doing two different exposures. So that will help give you some protection there. But you can also run the risk, for example, when you're exposure blending, that once you've done your two exposures, there's a risk that the camera moves ever so slightly between those exposures, which you're there if you are having to wipe off the camera lens. Now, either way, there are rewards and risks, but of course, you know, at the end of the day, you pay your money and you take your choice. So there you go, there's a few different reasons as to why you should or shouldn't use graduated filters in landscape and travel photography. But at the end of the day, is there really a right or wrong answer who knows? That's up to you. But at the end of the day, you tell me. If you want to comment down below, I'm always happy to, to talk to people, discuss things. As those of you that follow me for a long time, you know that I will always answer those comments. So if you've enjoyed this video, please do give a thumbs up. And if you haven't subscribed, then please do consider doing so by clicking on the subscribe button down there and the notification bell up there in the top corner for all future videos that are being put out. So until the next time, wherever it might be, I don't know what it will be, as it's uh, not the best weather at the moment here in central France. Take it easy and stay safe out there, folks. Goodbye and see you again in the next one sometime soon.